Uh, good afternoon. This is Jean-Pierre Mobasser with Goodman Campbell Brain and Spine coming from Indianapolis. And today we're discussing another session of the AANS Operative Grand Rounds on Spinal Surgery. With us we have Eric Notmeyer from uh, Mayo Clinic of Florida. Good afternoon, Jean Eric. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. We're going to be discussing image-guided spinal surgery setup and techniques today. Uh, first, we need to go through disclosures, and you can see uh, Eric's disclosures listed here. Mine are not listed, but include a, a Medtronic consulting role, some consulting with Synthes as well, and Annulex, and then a royalty with Inomed. So there's a little history behind image-guided navigation that starts in the 90s and obviously cranial surgery leading the way for spinal surgery. Um, and let's talk about early uses of navigation. And I think there's still maybe some misconceptions of how much uh, spinal navigation is advanced from these early years. You know, John Pierre, point matching was the initial registration modality in spinal image guidance. And this involved picking out points on a preoperative 3D CT scan and then dissecting those points out on the patient and matching those points to the computer. As you imagine, this could be quite cumbersome, could be time consuming, typically could only register one segment at a time. It was quite difficult in revision surgery, especially with uh, patients who have had previous laminectomies as it was difficult to, to find points and, and match points. And so it's no surprise that many surgeons who tried spinal image guidance back in this era quickly abandoned it never to come back to it again. Yeah, in my training we were doing Floronav at that time and it was adding at least two to three hours to a case and I think a lot of people's early experiences have made them believe that, spine, that navigation in spine surgery will actually increase the time of surgery, but our experience nowadays is otherwise. Would you yeah, agree with that? Yeah, I would agree. That? I think uh, image guidance now, especially with the CBCT technology registration, uh, takes significant time off of our surgery when compared to doing a, the same procedure without image guidance. And obviously there are multiple different systems on the market. Uh, we're not here to really promote any one over the other, but I think the, the key is that this cone beam computed uh, tomography gives us an axial cut so we can be looking in an axial view in addition to whatever trajectory views we want to see in placement of these uh, instrumentation. Um, Disadvantages with this is uh, obviously that in people with uh, wide shoulders, heavier patients, there can be some limitations at the cervical thoracic junction. It's not quite the resolution of a true CT scan. However, it's still uh, quite good. Uh, why don't you go over the basics of this real quickly so somebody can understand how this works. Okay, so, uh, you know, how the image guidance works is that you're going to have infrared light emitted from a, a camera and that's going to go ahead and reflect off of spheres on both the reference arc and the instruments uh, that the surgeons use. And this light's reflect, reflected back to the camera. And this allows the computer to track instruments in 3D space. And so, you know, one of the initial steps with uh, image guidance in the operating room is placement of the reference arc. And this is a key step to uh, uh, taking out some of the cluster factor of image guidance. Number one, you should always have this arc between the camera as well as uh, the instruments that uh, you're, you're uh, using. And so, if you keep this arc between the camera and the surgeon's instruments, that takes out a lot of line of sight issues that you may uh, experience. Additionally, if you put this reference arc on a level above what you're instrumenting, for example, in this case, I'm doing an L3 to L5 fusion, and I get the reference arc on L2, and try to place this as low as possible uh, to the patient's skin without touching the skin, uh, then that can take out a lot of the line of sight issues also. Yeah, and I think you're bringing up some really important issues, and I would add to them the the areas where there are pitfalls with navigation. And I think one of these can be if you don't have anything screwed on properly, if the balls aren't snapped all the way down, if the tap or the screwdriver isn't seated all the way in in the uh, reference handle, you're going to get some false readings or inaccuracies that could affect what you're doing. So I think having a checklist of all these things is absolutely critical, not to mention the fact that you can have a new scrub tech in your room who accidentally bumps the reference arc without knowing the importance of that. So uh, here we can see an example of a percutaneously placed uh, reference arc into the posterior superior iliac crest with the camera at the foot of the bed, again, to keep that in uh, proper position for line of sight issues. Um, 
Eric, why don't you talk about what you're showing at yeah, this one point? One of the issues we've had with 